Chapter 14, Wonders of the Deep. We awoke very early the next day. We were ready to travel by sea, which would be faster and less tiring than our previous method. Two poles spliced together formed a mast, and a blanket was a sail. We loaded all of our provisions, and Hans took the tiller. We set sail. At the moment of leaving the harbor, we decided to call it Port Gretchen. Due to the dense atmosphere, we moved swiftly. We expected to see the opposite shore within one day. It wasn't long before we could no longer see the shore behind us, nor the one before us. Immense shoals of seaweed came into view. These were three or four thousand feet long, wading like serpents. I watched them for hours and wondered what natural force could have produced such plants. We traveled fast and far due to the winds, but still we couldn't see the opposite shore before us. We had no way of knowing if Sagnusum had also traveled the sea. On another day, my uncle dropped our anchor to see how far it was to the bottom of the ocean. But even after lowering the anchor for more than 200 fathoms, we didn't reach the bottom. When we pulled it up, however, it did bear the imprint of teeth as if a huge undersea creature had bitten it. We were on a, our guard from that moment on. There was no darkness here. It was as if we were sailing under the Arctic sun. One day, a terrible shock awoke me. The raft was heaved up on a watery mountain and pitched down again, at a distance of twenty fathoms. What is the matter, my uncle shouted. Have we struck land? Hans pointed with his finger at a dark mass six hundred yards away, rising and falling alternately with heavy plunges. I looked and cried, is an enormous porpoise? Yes, my uncle replied with shock. There is also a giant sea lizard, and farther on is a monstrous crocodile. Look at its large jaws and its rows of teeth. It is diving down. There is a whale, I cried. I can see it's his great fins. See how he is throwing out air and water through his blowers. We stood amazed at the presence of such a herd of marine monsters. They were of supernatural dimensions. The smallest of them would have crunched our raft, crew and all, with one snap of its huge jaws. Hans wanted to get away from this dangerous area. He saw other creatures that could threaten us on the other side of our raft. There was a 40-foot-long tortoise and a 30-foot serpent. There seemed to be no limit to the marbles. These creatures encircled our rafts. Then they began to fight amongst themselves. My uncle, through his telescope glass, saw that the beast with the porpoise snout and the cro crocodile's teeth was really a plesiosaur, a prehistoric fish lizard. It was the most terrible and ancient monsters of the deep. And the other, I asked with disbelief? The other is an ichthyosaur, a lizard-like serpent, he answered. He is the dreadful enemy of the other. Those huge creatures attacked each other, rocking our raft in the waves they created. Suddenly, they disappeared below the water, leaving a whirlpool eddying in the water. Several minutes passed while the fight continued underwater. All at once, the enormous head of the plesiosaur darted up. The monster was wounded to death. As for the ichthyosaur, we never saw it again. The wind blew violently as we left the scene of the primitive struggle. Hans was still at the helm. My uncle, no longer distracted by the combat, began again to look impatiently around him. The voyage to the other side of the sea was longer than expected. The wind was unsteady and fitful. The temperature was high. At about noon, we heard a distant, continuous roar. In the distance, there is a rock against which the sea is breaking, my uncle said. I heard roaring that seemed to come from a very distant waterfall. I hoped we wouldn't be thrown over it. Hans climbed the mast to take a look. He sees something, my uncle said. I see it too. It is a vast, inverted cone rising from the surface. If it is another sea beast, let's get out of its path, I said. Let us go straight on, my uncle yelled. I appealed to Hans, but he maintained his course inflexibly. At eight in the evening, we are only two leagues from it. Its enormous body was spread upon the sea like an island. We were getting near a monster that could eat a hundred whales a day. Terror seized me, but my uncle would not give in. Geyser, Hans said. It is a geyser, like those in Iceland, my uncle said. At first, I couldn't believe that I had mistaken an island for a monster. The geyser rose majestically. 
Deep and heavy explosions were heard from time to time. The enormous jet spouted water until it reached the clouds. Let's dock, my uncle said, but we must avoid this water spout. It would sink our raft in a moment. My uncle and I climbed onto the island while Hans stayed at the raft. We reached the central basin, out of which the geyser came. I plunged a thermometer into the boiling water. It marked an intense heat far above the boiling point. This water came from a furnace. Was this proof of the Earth's central heat? My uncle wouldn't admit it. Still, it seemed to me that someday we would reach a region where the Earth's central heat attained its highest limits. It would go beyond a point that can be registered by our thermometers. We shall see, my uncle said. He named this island after me. We left the island after Hans refitted the raft's rudder. By my observations, we had crossed 270 leagues of sea since leaving Port Gretchen. We were 620 leagues away from Iceland.